Okay. Now, uh, just two things before we go further. Number one, uh, the video clip by, with my mistake, was not available on Friday. I thought it was available, but there was some kind of a miscommunication on my side. Now, in general, as we promised, it would be available on Friday, latest Saturday mornings every week. Now, if you look at the, the, the library, every day is going to be written as a different lecture. So lecture one is uh, basically uh, the first week. Lecture two is first week, second hour, so on and so forth. So each hour is going to be a different video. OK. OK. Now let's go ahead with this week's material. Now the first thing that I'm going to do this week is to, to basically recapture the material that we covered in individual sections last week. This is, I think, an important way of getting the feedback and giving you the information which is gathered from different sections. So this is what we will do. So, now, uh, the first thing that I did in the sections after I lectured for a long time and so on, I always talk a lot, what I did is I describe, uh, I ask you actually to describe the sub-processes after a plane reaches a gate until it leaves the gate for another destination. So this was the way that I specified. In every section, I used exactly the same words because I had that written in front of me. Okay? Now, what I ask you is, I ask you to give me the things that are happening. Of course, you, there is nothing that you read before. I'm aware of, the, of that. You watched a few clips, or uh, maybe you have your own experience. Okay? So uh, a number of things came out there. I think that's not very important, the, the individual things that came out. But one thing which is very important is the way that specific duration was defined. Okay? I specifically wanted to emphasize a certain process or a group of processes that will start from the point that the plane is at the gate up to the point, time point, where the plane leaves the gate. So there might be a lot of parallel things happening. And as, as you can see in most of the groups, I think in all of the groups, you included certain processes that may not be specified in this specific time duration. For example, you talked about the security checks going into the airport of passengers. Now, it may or may not fit into this time duration. Moreover, the way that I describe this problem is in such a way that it's, not, it's definitely interrelated. I'm not suggesting that they are independent. But you have to understand that the way that you frame the problem is extremely important if you are going to solve it. If you leave it loose, as I did on purpose in the sections, everybody will understand a different thing on that definition. So you have to be very precise on the things that you are including and you are excluding, OK? Now, of course, this is the case if you are solving a real problem. If we are solving an example problem here, we don't care that much. But you have to understand that problem boundaries is one of the critical issues that you will always remember in the future. Boundaries. So is it included or, it, or, or not? When am I going to include that? If it is very much related to something else that's going on and affecting its time, of course, you should put it in, so on and so forth. But this is what we call the art side of modeling. Every technical field, engineering field, or sciences has a part which is called modeling. You model a real thing. Sciences does the same thing as well. Uh, you model a certain real phenomena, and you have to put the boundaries on it. For example, if you are designing, let's say that you are a material scientist, you are designing a certain material, what you do, the first thing that you do, for example, the coat that I am wearing, 
it's, it's, it uses a nanotechnology kind of fiber, I think, in it. Okay, it's very light. It's, I think, 35 grams, something like that. Okay, so what, how do you start? That's a, definitely a technical problem, am I right? You first specify the temperature level that you want to attain for protection when you are designing this. So you have something in target. So that sets a certain set of boundaries to your system. This is actually a very technical work, and this is what we do. Same thing is true with the way that we define things. Now, I loosely define that. We understood certain things. 88% of everything actually match, but 12% thought that certain processes that may not be included in this definition, they, they talked about those processes. OK, so this is number one. Then what did I do? I asked for possible improvement ideas. Any questions on the first one? Any questions or comments? OK, now the second thing that I did was, after writing certain sub-processes, I said, how are we going to improve this? Now, again, we didn't have any background technical knowledge about that, of course. But the idea is that as a person who is using those systems, we have an understanding of what may improve the problems that we foresee. So this is what we did, actually. And I said that our objective performance criteria is to decrease the total time that the plane stays at the gate. So I specifically moved you to a direction where we would like to minimize this time. And then we made separate, several different discussions on the actual improvement uh, ideas that you had. Now, basically, I am going to go over your proposals. OK, remember, I, well, you, you probably didn't see it, but after every section, after you leave, I wrote all of them down the things that I wrote on the board. And so I grouped them and regrouped them and so on. Some of them are similar, of course, in different sections. And I'm going to bring those up to you in sort of in another way that uh, will make a lot of sense. OK, any questions on this? OK, now, the, one of the typical sub-processes that we had was unload, load baggage. OK? Now, there are a number of different proposals, which, for example, you always have the proposal of increasing the crew size. So increase the number of people that does this job. So you're going to do it faster. Of, of course, I didn't write those all the time. OK? So that's something which is obvious. So if two people are carrying all the bag, if you put a third one or a fourth one, it will be faster. OK, that's obvious. What is the trade-off there? We're going to discuss it, but let me remind you. There is a trade-off, of course. You're paying more money. OK, that's obvious. Now, one other, object, uh, one other thing came in one of the sections who said that, why don't we standardize baggage? What do we mean by standardization? Now, you know that every baggage is a dif different size. The handle is at different locations. So everything is sort of different. So if somebody is going to handle that baggage, has to find out where the handle is, has to find out where the weight, the, the, uh, the center of gravity is of that bag, because it changes depending on the height of the bag and so on. And so it becomes really difficult. So one thing to do is to standardize. Now, how are we going to do that? Maybe an idea. Is, is very straightforward. You are all familiar with UPS, United Parcel Service, or Federal Express, or Yurti, well, Yurti Chicago is less careful in that. But for example, if you are sending something with Federal Express, as long as it is lower than a certain weight, they always put it in a standard envelope that they have. Now, why do you think that is useful? Because it's easier to carry, it's easier to handle, they know how to do it. Now, can we do the same thing for the baggages? We might have some equipment, very light-weighted equipment, where we're going to place our bag in and close the zipper. So you're going to have standard bags all around. 
And so kidding and, and so on will be much easier. So that, that's one of the ideas, and I think it deserves some attention. OK. So this is basically for unload and load package. And as I said, there are some others which talked about uh, changing, uh, uh, changing the, uh, uh, well, improving more in a different way. Now, I am going to have this one coming in again because there were some other possibilities, other options that were proposed. So if you don't find your option, s still you can sit down for a few minutes because I'm going to have other types of proposals at the back in a different way. Okay. Now, the second one is passenger in and out. So everybody is aware that there is always an improve room for improvement in this case. And, well, you know it from your experience. And most of the proposals that you suggested was to have passengers in the plane invited in a certain order. Or there is a certain way of bringing in the passengers to the plane. Okay? Now, whether this is going to be by grouping or by doing something else and so on. And I, if you recall, for in some sections, I told you to look at the website of Southwest Airlines. Because their application is rather different. What they are doing is they are not assigning seats to anybody. They are giving number one to the first customer who enters the gate. So, and they are taking everybody according to those numbers. Very simplified. So when you enter the plane, you look at, if you are number one, you look at the round and sit wherever you want. If you are number two, you look at the empty seats that are available and sit. Now, tests show that actually this increase the way that the customers get in in an enormous way. Of course, we are sacrificing something. What are we sacrificing? Sacrificing. In other words, this looks nice. Yes. You could sell the seats. This is what Pegasus is doing, actually. They are selling each seat if you want to have an assignment. So what they are doing is they are trading off a little bit delay time, because they are delaying the plane because of that, with money, OK? So in order to make more money. So this is basically the trade-off, OK? But time is also money. We know that. Uh, the more you stay on the ground, the, the less revenue you make for a plane. OK. Now, another group of proposals was, why don't we increase aisle width, the, the distance between two seats? Or why don't we have less number of rows? It's the same thing. OK, so that people will move easily. OK, so this is another thing. Another one was, especially for customers who are coming out of the plane, use some uh, moving platforms so that they will leave the gate as, as fast as possible. And another one is, why don't we redesign the uh, gates so that the amount of the, the, the total distance that we walk is less and less? So that's another thing. And another option was, why don't we have more doors? Now, in newer planes, where, uh, which is going to have 300 passengers for shorter flights, shorter distance flights, there will be more doors, actually, because the, the number of passengers is more. So that's, that's another thing which is important. So most of the things that you, are, you have suggested, actually, if you look at, if you Google them, if you look at some airlines, they are using improvement procedures of this sort. Some of them, of course, not uh, this one and this one is, this one, these two are a little bit, or these three are a little bit more difficult to attain in an easy way. OK, questions on this? OK, let's go to the next group. OK, I have again unload and load baggage, but this time, I am going to be a little bit more, what? Well, the things that I am writing here are becoming a little bit more sophisticated. Up to this point, the things that I have were sort of standard things that you would do. It will, it, it, they are the first thing that comes to your mind. 
Now, second group, unload load baggage. Better handling crew schedules. OK? Now, you can see that I am not necessarily increasing the size of the crew. But what I am suggesting is I know that baggage, for example, is loaded and unloaded in parallel way in how many different parts of the airport. You probably have 50, 60, 70 different crews in the airport, maybe 100, doing all this job. Now, what if I schedule them in a better way so that they will spend more time in front of each plane? Schedule means that they are not going to wait for the next plane to come, but we will have a more efficient schedule. So this is more sophisticated. It's not easy to get. This is like, uh, for example, some of you always complain that you don't have your lectures following each other. OK, you want your lectures to be all in, the in, in four hours without any break so that you finish and go home and eat what your mother and father is preparing for you. OK? Now, on the other hand, I prefer my university vision is to have lectures with breaks in the middle so that you will make use of this environment more. Anyway, but let's say that I am in favor of the first. So what I can do is maybe I can reschedule all the courses in such a way that most people in the classroom will have courses in a more compact way. I can do that, but do you think that it's easy? Well, given that we are finite in number, professors, given that lecture halls are finite in number, this is a tough problem. It's not that easy to do that. You can maybe obtain better solutions, but probably in overall, if somebody is getting better, another person might be getting worse. OK. So this is one. Crews with more people, this is also understandable. It looks simple in the beginning, but the I'm, I'm going into a lot of detail, by the way. I want you to visualize what's going on there. Now, remember, you are loading, unloading, and the, the door of the plane is of a limited size. What happens if you have 16 people there? Do you think that it will be of many help? Some of them are not going to do anything. In other words, you have a limited space. Unless you do a different type of organization, Okay. Uh, you are not going to make use of crews with more people. So it's not a straightforward adjustment. Just bringing in more people, they are going to do more job. It's not true. Now, this is another proposal. We can design new equipment. Somebody suggested that we can do loading and unloading concurrently Okay, with, with new equipment. This is, this is too complicated. Now, I can visualize certain approaches, but this is not an easy way out. I mean, you have to think about this a lot. Now, any questions on this? Let's look at more sophisticated passenger in and out rules. Now, you can restructure the cabin baggage locations so that people, when they are taking their luggage from the cabin, are living in a faster way. Now, and currently where they are, they are located at the top. So I am personally having a lot of problems with picking up anything. Although I have the height, I have a problem in my back, so I cannot carry very uh, heavy stuff. Now, on the other hand, most of our people are short, so they cannot reach it, even if they are healthy. So I am long and unhealthy. OK. so. But what can we do? Can we restructure it? For example, why don't we hire the seats of the plane and use the floor as a space to stock our luggage? If we create something like this, a, a little window of this sort underneath, that may solve the problem. But is it easy? Probably not. This is also, again, a sophisticated proposal. Now, more gates, more doors to gate. Again, you have to solve it with the plane restructuring. New gate layout designed. It's not only like simple changes like distance, but 
you design the whole thing together. And I think probably in, in the next 10 years, we're going to see extremely modern airports where the airports would look, start to look like more like Ashti or any bus station that we have in Turkey, where the buses can go all the way in, almost up to the door, and uh, with, with some technology around it, of course. So we're going to see different types of gates. Instead of having bridges going out, we're going to have slots in the terminal buildings where planes can enter. So well, probably there will be some change. But again, is this change straightforward? No. And we'll talk about that. OK, let's go to the next page. OK, cleaning. Now, plane crew starts cleaning is probably, uh, again, crew size is one of the options that were brought in. Plane crew starts cleaning is something which is used in smaller planes. Smaller planes are more efficient with respect to flying more. So they don't want to spend a lot of time on, in the, in, on the ground. So the crew who has less to do compared to a larger plane would do the cleaning himself or herself. Okay? So this is basically what is applied. And some of, them are, uh, some of these notions are applied by different airlines. Now, others. I think we had very valuable other prop, uh, suggestions coming in. Uh, it wasn't, uh, these are different than what we had in the previous years. So, for example, we can have smaller planes. Actually, one of the reasons of success of Southwest Airlines is that their, uh, the, the set of planes that they use are always the same. So they have, let's say, 500 planes. All of them are 737s, Boeing 737s. So this is going to make life easy for them. Why? Because they are of a certain size. They are not very large. Number two, we have a lot of difficulty for the crews when the style of the plane changes. But they always go and maintain the same plane. They load, unload baggage from similar planes. And, and so they have a lot of ways of uh, upgrading the service quality that they give. So this is the way that they approach the problem. Training crews is something which is important. Okay? You have to spend some money so that the crew is going to be better trained. Would know what is going on instead of like doing it in the way that the buses are doing in Turkey. Okay? Now we are becoming, the planes are becoming like the old buses of Turkey, where you have varying service. Okay? They don't do much. Now, other, op other proposals with respect to speed up check in operations, e-ticket, one security control, and so on, they are very valuable, but I'm not sure whether they are in the time span that I mentioned when I started to specify the process. But if it is in the time span, of course, you may want to make use of it. OK. Now, this part is sort of repetition in the sense that uh, I wanted to basically bring up the things that were said in the sections. Now, if I wrap up, OK, now this is crucial, because this is where IE's role or complexity, as I mentioned before, is going to come into picture. Now, Simple ideas may work. Trade-off is demand effect. In other words, you may have a simple idea uh, which is going to ask the passengers to do something for you so that the process will be faster. OK? Very simple. Now, that might make some customers select the other airline. In other words, you may have a drop in the demand. Because I don't want to carry, let's say, my luggage to the, to the plane. Okay? If you, for example, let's say that we want to eliminate baggage in, baggage out process. So what do you do? You ask the passengers to bring a limited size of bag into the plane themselves. So that process is eliminated. Now, I will be a little bit dissatisfied if that service is not given to me. Moreover, that will limit the total amount of bags that I can bring to the plane. Or if they charge for it, again, I will have probably select the other airlines. 
OK, so it means that you are going to lose some demand. So you see that this trade-off idea is everywhere. Either you lose money or you lose prospective money. OK? There is always this trade-off. And IEs are basically, we make decisions understanding that trade-off and stop in a place which is going to optimize whatever we are trying to optimize. OK. Second one, more sophisticated proposals requires planning. You cannot just do it immediately. Now, three typical plans or two typical plans that we considered here is schedule. Now, we're going to see next hour what a schedule is in more detail. But basically, I know that if I can rearrange, for example, departure times, I can make use of the crews, cleaning crews, in a better way. Why don't I have a plane departing once every hour? So that one crew will be sufficient. It, they will go from one to the next and to the next and so on. So things would be very quick, actually. But what will happen then? Of course, the airlines are going to lose a lot of money. They want to have schedules in a different way. So this is one thing. Another one is layout. And again, we're going to see certain things about layout, I think, this week uh, to in tomorrow's or Friday's lecture. We're going to see what we mean by layout. But these require all planning. Those two are courses, elective courses, that you can take in your third or fourth year. OK, so they actually make up one course material, at least. OK. Now, when uh, another thing that maybe you have noticed that nobody gave a lot of suggestions with respect to the technology that's going on around. For example, what did we say? We said they have to check the plane. They have to check the tires. They have to check the engine. But that was the extent that we were able to say. In reality, they are doing millions of different little things there, actually, to do the maintenance. Now, as it requires some technical knowledge ahead of time, we were slower in creating suggestions. So even if you are very clever and you have a lot of experience, the extent of suggestions that you can bring is limited unless you know that system. So you have to get to know the system. So it's not that easy to sit here in this classroom or to teach here in this classroom, talk about airline management without doing any actual work for airline management or airline systems or airport systems, whatever. So you can see that the iceberg, we are only seeing the tip of the iceberg. There is a lot of details that are left there. And our job is not going to be as simple as what we do here. Like, let's do this, let's do that. So we have to know the reality. Now. This is the last one. Smart ideas are necessary. In some sections, I was really angry with some of the groups. Not angry, but like I was expecting more, probably. And I said that you have to create good ideas. OK? This is wake up call. OK. So you have to create good ideas. Unless you create good ideas, you are not going to bring in good suggestions. You might be technically very well equipped. But if you don't have good ideas, you will be sort of, uh, you will not be using your own capacity in, an, in a nice way. So number one, you have to be bright. Come in with ideas that will work. Number two, have the necessary technical background to make sure that you do all the planning that's available. So it's not going to be a slogan. The good idea is a slogan, but you have to fill the bottom part of that slogan. And number three, implementation brings a lot of problems. You have to be able to solve that. So you have to be patient. Okay? Unless you have these three properties, I can tell you that you are not going to be a good engineer. So the first one is I believe that you are all quick and you can do a lot of things. Second one, technical skills we're going to teach you here. Third one, patience and being able to communicate and at the same time convert real problems into 
your background knowledge so that you can use the background knowledge depends on you. So you have a lot of work to do if you want to be a good engineer. OK, questions? OK, let's go one step further. Now, let's talk about airport operations now in a rather different way. Now, notice that in the handout that I gave you, I wasn't expecting you to write a lot of things. But now, probably these are important because these are going to be the material that you are going to see in the next three years. I'm sort of summarizing it. OK. Now, airport operation is a complex operation. It is a combination of numerous processes. There are a large number of processes involved. Some of them, you have to artificially define some boundaries in order to separate them, because they are all intertingled, intermingled together. OK, the word mingle is not something which is very nice in these days. Mingle always creates, uh, but this is, the, this is the truth. Interrelated, intermingling operations, processes. OK, now note that this is basically why we exist. If you look at the history of IE, OK, if you are interested, some of you will be if, when you are writing the term paper. The way that industrial engineering was born was after the Industrial Revolution. Now, what happened in the Industrial Revolution? In the Industrial Revolution, certain things made possible for mass production. For example, number one is standardization. OK? So previously, let's, let's for example, consider this pen. OK, now the pen, this pen has two different components, this component and the cap. Now, you, can, you, you are born in an era, and I was born in the same era as well, where all the caps would fill all the pens, would fit all the pens. In other words, if I change this cap with another one, it is still going to fit. The color may not fit, of course, but it is always going to fit. Why? Because the way that this, this is manufactured is according to certain standards. Now, before this idea could have been implemented, the standardization, people were manufacturing each pen independently. So what was important was simply to have a cap and the pen itself fitting each other. There was no concern of fitting this cap with another pen. Okay. This is standardization. Now, this was one of the very important ideas behind the Industrial Revolution. The second one was division of labor. Now, once you have standardization, you can have some people doing this and some countries doing this. So that a third country is going to bring them together and create the pen. Whereas previously, you have to have some very good professionals, artists, doing this one by one, where you can do it only in one location. This is number two. So with these two advances, Industrial Revolution came, which allowed for producing certain things in larger quantities. However, it turns out that if you are working in a small shop like this, you can manage for yourself if you are smart enough. If we increase the shop size, increase the number of items that we are manufacturing, things are going to be very complicated. So it turned out that certain engineers tried to fill this role by making decisions for the shop, which is becoming more complicated. But eventually, at the end of the 19th century, beginning of 20th century, any a new engineering field came into existence, which actually took the responsibility of dealing with this complexity in manufacturing environments. Remember, manufacturing environments, I specifically said this, in environments where you actually physically create a, a certain product. 
But after that, probably in 2030, in 1950s, 60s, and so on, we started to have service operations, like airports, like financial services, banks, and so on, coming into picture again. And again, industrial engineering turned out to be quite important in dealing with complexities, because the technical background of IEs was enabled them to deal with that, that, those complex problems as well. Okay, so you can see that complexity comes from history. That's the reason why it was not one of the original engineering fields, like computer engineering, like uh, environmental engineering. It's not an original engineering field, but it's a field that came into existence as we started to realize that we can look at large systems in a different way. So this is, this is basically the relation. OK, let me take a little. OK, I'm talking nonstop. I'm good for me. OK, now, third one. Now, the decisions that you undertake in systems like this are embedded to each other. For example, let's say that you are going to make certain process that we discussed last week faster. But it will have an implication for the slower process. Okay, so they are related to each other. They are not completely independent. This is very important to keep in mind because this is the reason why we are limiting the scope of a certain problem at a given time. Remember, I first solved the rice problem with a given rice. Then I was able to go and select among set of rices because that problem in itself would have been very difficult for me to see the details. But what I did was I said, why don't I select a, a rice type and solve the problem for it, at least conceptualize a solution. And next step was to deal with different types of rices. OK, now what is our role again? I will repeat this over and over again until you say that it's enough. We know what IE's role is. Improvement is basically changing these decisions. So what we do as IEs is we learn tools in the second, third, and fourth year. We're going to learn tools which is going to give decisions under certain circumstances. Okay? So those decisions are going to bring the improvement. And we're going to see some examples starting, I think, next week, especially we're going to see some decision examples. OK. Now, another thing which is important is when we talk about improvement, we're not talking about something which is arbitrary. For example, we have a discussion going on uh, in Turkey about more democracy. What's the meaning of democracy? What do we mean by more democracy? What do we mean by certain things? You have to make sure that those definitions are understood clearly. Fortunately, we're not social scientists, so we're not going to deal with that hard problem. Our problems are easier. But again, if we want to make sense, we have to make sure that the performance measure that we use is clear. Okay? If it is not clear, then we will see happenings as we are having in these days as about democracy or about other things. Okay. Now, we have seen three examples for improvement. One of them is... Okay. Okay. One of them is improvement. And we're going to do it with schedule layout. And the third one is equipment selection, where probably towards the end of the year, we're going to see an example. OK, so we're coming almost to the end. OK, generalizations. Again, what I suggest you is to have these pages in front of you when you are taking another course as well. OK, because I think these are sort of the the logic underneath those courses are all carried here. We have time span of decisions. I, we discussed this with, in some sections, actually. Not maybe in all sections, but short, medium, long, and in more sophisticated words, we call it operational, 
tactical and strategic. Strategic decisions are usually uh, performed with less information. You have less knowledge of the future. Okay? So it, it, we are more towards tactical and operational decisions in the field. Of course, you're going to be specialized and so on and so forth. But this is, this is what we are for. Note that you have to understand in the rice cooking example or in the airline example, long-term decisions are also going to affect the performance. But you have to make sure that your problem definition, your decisions that you are going to deal are all more or less at the same time scale. Because if you are going to compare equipment selection, kitchen equipment versus rice type, it's, it's a hard, it becomes a hard decision. In other words, those are not very much comparable because one of them has long-term effect, the other one is short-term effect. Okay, now two more things here. In order to deal with these type of problems, we have what's called the engineering approach. Actually, it's a process that we apply. We're going to see it at the last lecture of the semester. So how am I going to phrase it is going to be a subject in the last lecture of the semester. But this is an approach. And you usually specify it qualitatively with some words. But I'm hoping that it will have some meaning when we come at the end. It's also a process. And basically, we have to understand that this is what differentiates us from other non-engineering fields. Because number one, we are going to have the technical background. Number two, we have a more analytic approach to problems that we are solving. OK. The last thing that I'm going to say before the break is, you see that you have, we need to have a mathematical orientation. Now, currently, we haven't seen what we mean by mathematical orientation, but I gave one example in the sections, if you remember. Remember, there was this number of things that we were going to do. I represented it as a network. Now, that's a mathematical representation. Another thing that I did was I created those functions that related rice cooking parameters like to cost. I, I was able to do that in, in one way. This is actually what we mean by mathematical representation. And I'm hoping that uh, this is, I'm going, I am clear about the fact that if you can do this, this is going to be the main difference, the main value that you're going to have as IEs over other smart people. Because you are more structured and you can solve it. OK, I think the last slide is going to tell itself. You have to, these are the things that should remain in your mind after these lectures. IE emphasis in complexity processes, performance measure, improvement idea, mathematical representation, time aspect. Next, uh, after the break, we're going to start dealing with how are we going, how can we be more structured when we are talking about a process? Up to this time, I just wrote it with my lousy handwriting, a set of processes one after the other. But now we will find some standard ways of doing it. And that will be next.